As we're looking at the book of Isaiah, I brought these five points up last week, and I want to just remind you of them. We're seeing a nation going through a degeneration in the book of Isaiah, still fairly prosperous, but being attacked from time to time, have become very uh, caught up in God fantasies, you know, the idea that God is whoever you think he is. Um, certainly make up your own, uh, your own decisions about who God is, very much like our world today. Um, and we notice that God comes along and he finds people in rebellion or revolt, rejecting him, refusing to listen, resisting his ways. And remember, if scripture is correct, God's ways are simply life. We're not talking about rules for being good here. You often so think that religion is all about trying to be good. Stop doing bad things so you can go to heaven. Which bad things seem like the fun things, right? So let's all be good. As, as one person put it to me, I finally decided it was better than the alternative, you know. Eternal boredom was better than the other option. So let's go to church for eternity and listen to long sermons and sing another song, another verse into the ceaseless ages of eternity. And if we're good, that's at least a better option than the other. We've, Satan has taken the, the life out of holiness. And um, what we're talking about here, in rebellion and sin and resisting God's ways are simply rebelling and resisting the ways of life. Anything other than God's ways is death with a few thrills on the way that usually get you addicted to something. The, the needs of our heart that God put there in the first place, the desires... I believe the deepest desires of our hearts, people, are not bad things, but are good things. The desire for love and joy and meaning and purpose. And we, when we don't find it, we have to anesthetize ourselves with something because we're so empty. And living life God's way, he says, is the way you will discover real meaning and purpose and joy and love. Not that has a kicker on the backside that flattens you out the next morning. Not the kind that leaves you really emptier when it's over because you felt like you were just on the verge of getting what you were seeking, but then it's a flat tire. God sits up in heaven, as it were, as a father, saying, why do you keep rebelling against life? And we've been deceived into thinking there's more life somewhere else than in God. That was the first temptation with Eve at the tree. There's more life somewhere else than following the ways of God. If you will do what God told you not to do, it will open up the door to greater life. And it really has just opened up the door to death. So when God says you're rebelling against me, he's not like a king's or a president or an IRS saying, you didn't pay your taxes, you're in rebellion. You know, you didn't do homage, you're in rebellion. You didn't follow protocol, you're in rebellion. You didn't keep all the laws, you're in rebellion. It's a father knowing the way of life with a bunch of teenage rebellious kids who are in the process of thinking they're having fun, but from your perspective, you know they're just killing themselves. And how in the world do you get them to see that? I mean, how many of you parents have scratched your head and beat your head against the wall and cried many tears? How can I help my kids see that if they follow the path I followed, it will only lead to a much heartache? But I didn't listen to my parents, <laughs> and they're not listening to me, 
And God is saying, you're not listening to me. And the problem is the stakes are total. And so God brings reproof. Reproof isn't him beating on our heads in anger. It's him reminding us, rebuking, reprimanding, remonstrating, trying to get us to see we're on a dead-end path with death. And he, he, he shows us that it will lead to ruin, wreckage, judgment. There will be consequences Unavoidable, intrinsic. I don't believe God has to beat on the lost, make a miserable. Sin makes you miserable. The wage of sin is death, not the wage of God against sin. God doesn't kill sinners. Sin is killing us. One of my favorite phrases. You've heard it many times if you've been around this church the last 16 years. God doesn't kill sinners. He really doesn't even have to punish sinners. Sin is killing us and making us miserable. And yet we think somehow it's the door to life. The results are intrinsic. Jesus didn't come to save us from what God is going to do to us because we sinned. That's the typical way I often hear the gospel explained. Jesus came to save us from the wrath of God. No, Jesus is God come to save us from the wrath of sin. And so the reproof and the warnings of ruin are just a parent trying to show the hard of hearing teenager, <laughs> hard of thinking, What's ahead if you stay on this path? The bridge is out. <laughs> no matter how good the road looks right now, the bridge is out. And then God promises, if, if, we will turn and follow him, we can be part of a remnant who survive because ruin is coming. The majority of this world is not listening. As he said in, in chapter 1 of Isaiah, I'm going to melt you down and skim off the slag. That means whether you're on God's side or the opposite side, we're in for a meltdown. It's going to get hot and uncomfortable in this world especially as we look at in chapters 2, 3, and 4 of that day, God says, the day when things are going to be different. Our entire worldview is based on uniformitarianism, the idea that things will continue on the way they have, evolving slowly, so slowly that we hardly can see the evolution within a given lifetime. So things will be pretty much the same tomorrow as they were today. There is no God. There is no divine intervention. There will be no cataclysm. There will be no second coming. There will be no judgment or intervention. There is no God. Eat, drink, and be merry because pretty soon you're going to die. That's life. God says, yes, there's going to be a meltdown. But all that will be skimmed off is the slag. It'll get hot for everybody the saved and the lost, the righteous and the wicked. But the remnant concept is that those who are the gold, the fire may be hot, but it doesn't hurt you. It purifies you, right? The gold is unharmed by the fire. What is it, 1 Corinthians, is it 3 or 6? I think it's 3, talks about if... if as, as ministers of the gospel, we build on the foundation of Jesus with gold and silver and precious stones. When that day comes, when the meltdown comes, the precious metals will survive. But if we build on the foundation with wood and hay and stubble, when that day comes, we will see our work consumed. 
And that's simply the day, as we saw last week in chapter 2, when God shows up in his glory for who he really is. A remnant will survive. The gold is never hurt by the fire. And then there will be a restoration. It's kind of like if you have an old car. I, I love it. There's a, there's a car I see every once in a while. It's a Toyota Camry. And it has a historic vehicle license plate. A Toyota Camry with a historic vehicle license plate? Yes, it's a 1977 Toyota Camry. It's over 30 years old. It's eligible for a historic license plate. And it's like, how could a Toyota Camry ever be a historic car? You know, maybe a, an old Jaguar or an old Triumph or, you know, something like that would be a historic car. A Model T or something, but a Camry? But no matter what you have, whether it's a Camry or a Jaguar, over time it picks up mud and rust and things begin to decay. And if you take it all apart and you clean everything up and you res get rid of all of the, the decay, the rust, the, the grime, and you just stick with the original stuff, the restoration process involves a purging of everything that's been picked up along the way. But when you're done, especially when God is done, it's brand new. Like the resurrection of Jesus. When he came out of the grave, it doesn't matter how much they wrecked his body on the cross. When he came out of the grave, he was whole. And he says, I'm the first fruit of the resurrection. The rest of you in your time at my coming. When we come up, it will be fully restored. So God gives this picture of rebellion. That's our problem. It's heading, heading us for ruin. Reproof, warning us of the ruin to come. The wreckage will happen, but if you're the true gold remnant, you will remain, return, survive, and be part of the renewal, the rebuilding, and the thriving of the eternal kingdom of God. That, we've got to keep that in mind because we see God saying, I will do this and I will do that, you know. I'm going to... Well, you'll see it in several passages today, and it sounds like he is just going to come and lower the boom. But we've got to see it as a parent trying somehow to guide these misguided young people into the way of life before they kill themselves and can't get there. So in chapter 1, God says, why do you continue to revolt? You're a mess. You've been beat up from head to foot. Verses 5 and 6. And yet you come to me, verses 12 and on, with your worship charades. You got blood on your hands. You got blood all over yourselves. You're a complete mess and you're messing each other up. But you think if you do these little worship incantations and festivals and you show up for an hour on Sabbath or Sunday morning and you give your offering and you do this religious stuff that somehow that's going to make a difference? He says, I can't stand it. Makes me sick. I'm going to melt you down until only the gold is left. Chapter 2 that we looked at last week begins with the restoration. There's coming a time, verse 2, the mountain of the Lord will be the highest mountain and all nations will flow uphill into it saying, come, let's go to the mountain of the Lord to the house of our God let, so he can teach us his ways, we can walk in his paths, so that he can be the judge and the decider among us. You know, if, if, if we would let God call the shots and actually follow them, then it says we'll beat our swords into pruning hooks and our spears into uh, plowshares or whatever. I'm quoting it there badly. There will be no more war when we actually listen to running the world God's way. But, verse 6 and on, my people, 
They've gone after Eastern religions. They've gone after the occult. They've gone after the idea that they can have their security in life by making uh, lots of alliances with foreigners. Uh, They've got more wealth and gadgets and stuff than they know what to do with. And they look for life, verse 8, to their idols, to the things that they have made. That is what they bow down to. What's the result going to be? Enter into the rock, verse 10. Because when God shows up in his glory, the lofty looks of man will be humbled and the haughtiness of men will be broken down. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. In that day, this day of God, when things are going to be different, when he's going to break in, there is going to be a cataclysmic break in. He's going to bring an end to this seemingly unending reign of sin. And in that day when he shows up, that's the thing people don't recognize is who God is. God doesn't have to show up and do something awesome. He just shows up and he is awesome. If he just showed up today, if he took the veil that he has put over him today and let his glory shine through, everyone in planet Earth would be on their face. Richard Dawkins included. The biggest atheists included would be saying, I'm convinced there is a God. But it wouldn't be because the heart desires a relationship. It just would be because God is so awesome. And he actually veils himself so that we have choice. Because if he came in all of his presence, we would have no choice but to be on our face. And God doesn't want the kind of subservience kings of this earth demand. He wants our hearts. He wants love. He wants us to say, come, let's go to the house of the Lord. He doesn't want to be behind us saying, get into the house of the Lord. There's there's nothing there for his heart. Remember, God is love more than he is power and majesty. But when he shows up, everything lofty, verse 12, will be cut down. And it names the high... The the big trees and the big mountains and the big cities and walls and the big ships, the biggest things in that day. And it says it will all be brought low and laid down. And the idols, the things that we made of our own hands, he will utterly abolish. They'll be throwing their gold and silver, verse 20, to to the moles and the bats. Because when God shows up, If you're not the gold, you're going to be trying to avoid the fire. Get out of the limelight. And chapter 2 simply ends with the phrase, um, I'm going to paraphrase it, don't put your trust in men whose breath is in their nostrils of what account is he. When God shows up, nothing human that we have placed our trust in will be of any help or value at all. It will be so overpowered by his presence. I mean, the Bible says when God shows up, the sun is ashamed and the moon hangs its head. Very poetic. It's like, you know, I have, I have a little mag light here on my keys, right? Well, it's bright, isn't it? Well, it is when it's dark in here. I walk in the sanctuary in the middle of the night sometimes, and I don't want to unlock and turn off the alarm to turn the lights on, so I just find my way around. This really helps. But with those lights shining, it's really not much at all, is it? It's been ashamed. <laughs> It's been eclipsed. I don't think when God comes, the sun actually quits shining. He's just so much brighter than the sun that we we won't even notice it. It'll go out like the stars go out in the daytime. They're still there. They're just eclipsed by the sun. Let me tell you something. Even science tells you that if the sun got a little closer to the earth, what would happen to all the works of man? Melted down, nothing left, life included. God doesn't show up and do something awesome. When he shows up, he is awesome. 
So this day of God, as we talked about last week in chapter 2, 3, and 4, talk about, it starts with ruin and it ends in glory. It starts with the meltdown, the slag scooped off, and then all that's left is the gold. So he says, don't put your trust in men who have breath in their nostrils. In other words, you can breathe your last in a second. Life seems so real, and yet it can be gone in an instant. What help is he in light of all of this? I want you to listen to chapters 3 and 4. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is taking away from Jerusalem and from Judah support and supply, all support of bread and all support of water, the mighty man and the soldier, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of fifty and the man of rank, the counselor and the skillful magician and the expert in charms. And I will make boys their princes, and infants shall rule over them. And the people will oppress one another, every one his fellow and every one his neighbor. The youth will be insolent to the elder and the despised to the honorable. For a man will take hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have a cloak, you shall be our leader, and this heap of ruins shall be under your rule. In that day he will speak out, saying, I will not be a healer. In my house there is neither bread nor cloak, you shall not make me leader of the people. For Jerusalem has stumbled, and Judah has fallen, because their speech and their deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them. For they have brought evil on themselves. Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked. It shall be ill with him, for what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. My people, infants are their oppressors, and women will rule over them. O oh, my people, your guides mislead you, and they have swallowed up the course of your paths. The Lord has taken his place to contend. He stands to judge peoples. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people? by grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. The Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, tinkling with their feet, therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will lay bare their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets and the scarves, the headdresses, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes and the amulets, the signet rings and nose rings, the festal robes, the mantles, the cloaks and the handbags, the mirrors, the linen garments, the turbans and the veils. Instead of perfume, there will be rottenness and instead of a belt, a rope, and instead of well-set hair, baldness, and instead of a rich robe, a skirt of sackcloth, and branding instead of beauty. Your men shall fall by the sword, and your mighty men in battle, and her gates shall lament and mourn empty. She shall sit on the ground. And seven women shall take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning. 
Then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day and smoke and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a canopy. There will be a booth for shade by day from the heat and for a refuge and a shelter from the storm and rain. Jesus, we need to understand these words. So we ask you to bring to our hearts and minds what you have for us. We pray in your name. Amen. So I believe chapters 2, 3, and 4 form a single unit. It starts with God is going to be lifted up in the end and all the nations will flow into his presence. It tells us what's wrong with his people. They've gone after eastern ways and occult and alliances and wealth and gadgets and the makings of their own hands. But when God shows up on that day, he's going to have a day, all of that stuff will be melted down. So don't put your trust in any of that. Chapter 3 then begins to tell us how this meltdown actually happens. And it precedes when God shows up. Because sin is in, in and of itself um, self-defeating. Have you noticed that every society falls apart? No society has managed to avoid decay. Entropy is everywhere. Everything without positive input begins to decay and fall apart. And so he now describes how the very society of his people is falling apart. Um, the Lord, verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord of hosts. That's an interesting phrase. I'm going to talk more about it later. But God doesn't primarily like to call himself the Lord or Yahweh of the earth or of a given territory. The word hosts can mean an army. Over and over again it means that. But it also just means a multitude. But I want you to notice, God identifies himself not primarily with territory, but with people. He's the God of people. He couldn't give a rip about gold and silver and wealth and territory. He can make all of that he wants to. But he made people unique. There will never be another one just like you in the history of, the, of eternity and the universe. God made us to be lovers of him, him and each other. There's something unique about image of God creations. He is the Lord of multitudes. He's the Lord of peoples. He identifies himself with people. Now he says, behold the Lord of peoples, of hosts. I know a lot of your Bible translations will call it the Lord of armies or the Lord of angel armies. And sometimes that host refers to the hosts of heaven, Sometimes that host refers to the host of an army. Sometimes it just refers to the host of a nation. All right? So he's the Lord of his creatures. The Lord of hosts says, or the Lord of hosts takes away from Jerusalem and Judea and Judah the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the supply of water. That stock in store is an interesting thing because it's the same word, one in the masculine form, one in the feminine form. And in the, I believe it's the masculine form, it represents a staff that you use, like a shepherd's staff, your rod and your staff, they comfort me, okay? An implement for walking. And yet the same word is then used as the sustenance that you lean on for survival. Supplies, bread... Food, air, water, okay? The staff of life versus the shepherd's staff. That's the concept, okay? Uses the same identical word. One, the staff you lean on physically. The other, the stuff you depend on to stay alive. So he says, I'm going to take away staff and stuff. Bread and water. Famine is coming. Isn't it interesting, the panic of the environmental community that refuses to acknowledge the existence of God and is so panicked that if we don't turn things around on this earth, we're going to run out of 
bread and water. Is there any, is there any movement among those who are so panicked about the world running out of bread and water to turn to the one who created it and promises to supply if we will serve him? No, we deny his existence. We must somehow come up with our own way. And God says, sorry, no matter how hard you try, you're going to run out of bread and water. Sin is a meltdown. Sin is destructive. Sin destroys the environment. And the mighty man and the man of war, the judge, prophet, diviner, and elder. So the, the, the man, mighty man and the man of war, those who protect us, the judge, prophet, diviner, and elder, those, those leaders of society, the captain of 50, the honorable, the counselor, and the artisan, and the enchanter, the various individuals who provide leadership in the community, he says they're all going to be gone. The way you're living, the way you're choosing to go about life, everything you have that keeps you together, both physically, societally, emotionally, is going to melt down and be gone. Now God says he's going to take it away. But once again... We've got to look at this from the concept that God is warning that this is what's going to happen and he can't do anything to prevent it because this is our choice. And of course, he could stop it from happening, right? He could keep pouring in the supplies while we rebel and kill each other and oppress one another. Or he can step back, which makes it seem like he's doing it, you know, Daddy isn't feeding me? Well, of course, you refuse to come home for dinner. <laughs> you know, we have this idea we should be out there and God should come out. You know, Dad should come out and find us wherever we are rebelling, refusing to come home, refusing to be in a relationship, saying, leave me alone, I want to be on my own. But when we're hungry, he should find us and feed us. And so we blame God for not showing up when we're running the other way, saying, stay away from me. Because then we get hungry. We get lonely. And so it's, it's seen as God doing it because God could stop it, but God believes in free will and he has to let it happen. Society is going to completely melt down. Verse 4, to the point where you're going to have children for princes and babes for rulers. You're going to have people in power running your country who have absolutely no experience or ability to do it. Does that sound familiar? And everyone will be oppressing one another. Anarchy. Everyone taking it out on their neighbor. What's going to happen if you have a nifty supply of food and water in the middle of Phoenix, stashed in your house, and everybody around you is hungry and thirsty? You talk about Rwanda. Everybody's going to be breaking into everywhere else looking for whatever might possibly be there. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't plan ahead. I have a few gallons of water stashed away. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, if you think you're going to somehow prepare for doomsday, somebody will just come and take it away. And the child or the boy will be insolent towards the elder, no respect for elders, and the base towards the honorable, no respect for people or position. I mean, folks, when I read this, I've got my country right here. And then a man takes hold of his brother in his own father's house and says, you've got a coat, you be our ruler, you take charge of this heap of ruins. I love that. You know, things get so bad that you're just looking for anybody who will please bring some order back to life. And he says, no, not me. I won't be your healer. The word is for binding up wounds. I won't, I can't fix this mess. I don't have food or shelter. I won't be your ruler. Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen. Why? Why? Verse 8, because their tongue 
and their doing, their speech and their actions are against Yahweh to provoke his glory. And this is where things get a little sticky trying to preach through Isaiah. Because the only way to turn our country or any country around is if your heart gets turned around. And if your heart gets turned around and you help someone else's heart get turned around and because the quality of society is the quality of the characters of the individuals who make up the society. You can't fix society from the top down or the outside in. You have to fix it from the inside out. And yet, not only is there the individual factor here in the book of Isaiah and in reality, but there is the corporate factor. And we who believe strongly in the concept of the separation of church and state, that the government shouldn't be running the church and the church shouldn't be running the government, this concept has been taken to one extreme to mean we ought to have God completely dismissed from society, public life, and anything to do with the government, as if somehow we're going to have freedom if we have only godlessness. And then you have the other side that says, no, we've got to fix it by reuniting religion and the state so that we make everybody do right. Well, if you make everybody do right, nobody's doing right. They're just doing what they're told. But there is this middle ground that nobody seems want to, to want to go down. We seem to have trouble with it. Where we recognize that the government can't run the religion, the religion can't run the government, but a society without God is going to be totally degenerate and fall apart and not be able to govern itself. And yet you don't want a government who demands what you do about God. And it's kind of like walking a tightrope. How in the world do you do this? But that's... That's what our founding fathers tried to do. They did not set up a, a government without God. But they did set up a government that didn't tell you how you had to relate to God. Even though our founding fathers, be they deists or Christian, believe that the Bible should be the basis of all public education. You just need to go read the, read the original documents instead of reading the revisionist history. So when you preach Isaiah, when you read Isaiah, not only do you have to apply it individually, but you have to deal with societal, corporate, national attitudes. But you've got to remember that's the sum total of the individuals, and you only fix it by fixing individuals. Personal restoration will lead to national restoration. It comes from the bottom up and the inside out only and what's wrong what's wrong verse 8 is our words and our deeds are against Yahweh God says this is the way and we say no I'm going this way we do it with our words and we do it with our actions. The look, verse 9, on their countenances, their face, witnesses against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to their soul, for they have brought evil upon themselves. Now, I don't want to just pick on the sin of Sodom which happened to be rampant, blatant homosexuality. That's the one we know about. But let me tell you, there's a lot more going on in Sodom than that. But what Sodom shows us is when living a life that God says is an abomination and will lead to death is not just done behind closed doors, but has become the violent arm of the society saying you will approve of and support our choices or we'll break down your door and rape your guests. That's Sodom. 
It's sin with no sense of shame. In fact, if you dare call it wrong, you're now going to be prosecuted for discrimination. Words and deeds are against Yahweh. It's as if the sin of Sodom, or it's like the sin of Sodom, written all over, no longer hidden. Verse 10, say to the righteous that it will be well with them. They will eat the fruit of their doings. Do you catch what that phrase says in that context? I was online looking at an actual flyer written within the system of the Department of Justice of our nation to the managers over the departments about an upcoming gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender pride month. And if you are a manager, if you're a person of over any other workers in the Department of Justice, you are told in this flyer, during this month, silence will be seen as negative. You must display pride stickers in your office. You must attend and affirm the lifestyle. Or you, well, they don't say what will happen, but they say silence will be seen as negative. You're no longer allowed to stand tall while others bow to the image. You must bow or burn. Do you get that picture? We Adventists have thought it was going to be about the Sabbath. We're discovering there may be other issues we have to bow or burn over societally. And so what does it say here? It says, Say to the righteous, it will be well. They will eat of the fruit of their doings. Stand tall. It may get hot. But the fire doesn't hurt the gold. And God will meet you in the furnace and you will eat of the fruit of your doings. I love it. He puts this picture together of blatant evil where it looks like there's no way out. The three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. And then he drops in this verse, tell the righteous. Tell those who refuse to cave in. Tell those who are willing to take whatever prosecution the society wants to put them because they're willing to call sin by its right name. We don't want to mistreat anybody. We don't want to marginalize anybody. But woe be a government that tells me I have to show approval to abominable sin. I don't want to persecute them. But don't make me bow. And God says, say to the righteous, it will be well. And boy, we need that encouragement sometimes, don't we? Oh, maybe there is hope. But woe to the wicked, verse 11, it will be, with, it, it will be ill with him. The reward of his hands will be given him. Remember the wages of sin are intrinsic. For my people, as for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. Sorry, ladies. Back in that society, women were not educated and they were not seen as reliable to be a witness in court, much less be government officials. And yet God used some women in some incredibly powerful ways. But it's pretty few and far between. It seemed to be a very male-dominated society. So take this in its context. I don't think that means that you are all incapable of being leaders. But the point he's making is the total inexperienced are in charge and ruling by the capriciousness of their whims, despots. Oh, my people, those who lead you, cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. Our leaders are leading us down paths to nowhere. But the Lord is going to stand, verse 13, and plead and judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of the people. And I'm going to have to stop with that point and not make it through chapters 3 and 4 today. But I want to, I want to make the point here that, that, that we can pick up on next time. 
When God steps forward in judgment, it can look like a Category 5 hurricane. It can feel like a complete and utter disaster. But there is a difference between judgment and disaster. The prophet of the Bible works to get people to accept the worst as God's judgment, not just as a religious catastrophe or a political disaster, but judgment. If what seems like the worst actually turns out to be God's judgment, it can be embraced, not denied or avoided, for God is good and intends our salvation. So judgment, while certainly not what we human beings anticipate in our planned future, can never be the worst that can happen. It's the best, for it's the work of God to set the world and us right. By viewing judgment, or by viewing disaster as judgment, people who are beaten down open themselves up to hope in God's future. In the wreckage of exile and death and humiliation and sin, the prophet ignites hope, opening lives to the new work of salvation that God is about at all times and everywhere. Remember when the planes flew into the Twin Towers? Some poor Christian preacher dared to say, dared to ask the question, could this be a judgment of God on our godless society? And he was booed and hooted and howled and called every negative word in the language. How dare he suggest? Oh. Yeah, because that would mean maybe there's something wrong with the way we're living. It's on a dead-end course. Maybe our country really is degenerating and we're in for more and more trouble. You mean God might have allowed that? No, I don't think he flew the planes, but he allowed it. He didn't protect us because we said, leave us alone. So he left us alone and said, by the way, this is what happens when I leave you alone. And a few people cried out and said, we need to change our course because this is a harbinger of things to come. And we were hooted down. And I don't know if you've been watching this, but the exponential increase in the bold in your face evil of our society in the last 12 years has been incredible. We are seeing things, hearing things as common everyday stuff that was not on the agenda 9-11-2001. I don't know about you folks, but I believe God allows those things to try to wake us up. The bridge is out. Would you rather hit a barrier, maybe be hurt, or go off the bridge and drown? And so sometimes God throws up a barrier and there's a smash up. And we say, oh, why would God do that? But yeah, God allows things. God stands up in judgment. And the judgment of God is a good thing. It may look like a disaster. But it's a disaster with a heart behind it for saving. Trying to warn. You let your kids suffer some consequences. Hoping they'll learn their lesson. See the light. If you keep covering the consequences, they'll just keep on in their ways of death. So God lets some consequences. And then he says, are you listening? Do you have eyes to see and ears to hear? And the nation says, no, don't talk to us about God. We're cutting God out. We don't want anything to do with it. And after that kind of a, of a judgmental warning that God allows, you see evil take off exponentially I really believe folks that we are headed for deep deep trouble economically the staff and the stuff is going to be gone everyone against his neighbor boys ruling over us capricious rulers who care nothing for the people and 
we are in for trouble. But God is going to stand in judgment. And he says to the righteous, hang on. You will eat the fruit of your deeds. Stand tall. You may go into the furnace. I may even light the furnace. But that's for purifying the gold and skimming off the dross so we can have a remnant and a restoration and actually go back to living life a way life is worth living. And that is the ways of God. Jesus, we struggle with these things of judgment and disaster and what you cause and what you allow. But we see a description, not just of Jerusalem and Judea, but of our nation, of, of our world. God, may we let you do in us your work of redemption and restoration so we can be gold in the middle of the fire. May we endure. May we shine. May we reflect your glory and your character. May we be part of the solution, not the problem. Not by condemning sinners but by living life, your life, your way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.